Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever it is that you are, wherever you may be. Thank you very much for making us a part of your day. I am Brad Franklin, creative content writer here in Chesterfield, and I'm very glad to tell you that Chesterfield Behind the Mic is on the air once again. Um, my thanks go out to everybody out there who's continued to support the show, who has followed it, subscribed to it, watched it, all of the different places that you can. We appreciate that. we got a great show lined up for you again today. I am joined by Jim Engel, who is the uh, representative on the Board of Supervisors from the Bermuda District. Jim, welcome to the show. How are you? Good. Thank you. I uh, appreciate you coming on. I, I know that this is a busy time of year and there's a whole lot going on. Uh, so appreciate you knocking out a few minutes and, and coming on the show. I guess the, the place I want to start with is, um, and I was talking to you a little about this uh, off air. Um, how does one, like, do you grow up wanting to be a supervisor? Because I, I, I feel like I should ask all of, uh, of you this because I'm kind of fascinated about how this all happens. When, when you, you know, growing up, if somebody had told you that in, you know, 2021, you'd be sitting here probably for your first podcast, right? That's right. Um, sitting here for your first podcast recording, talking about, you know, things going on in Bermuda as a supervisor, would that have come as a shock to you? Like what, 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 what did you think when you were growing up that eventually did you think that you'd, you know, do politics and be into public service? That's an interesting question. Um, when I was a kid, about 10 years old, my parents were part of the neighborhood association. Okay. And um, you wouldn't necessarily think of a neighborhood association associated with politics, but I can assure you that that was my first <laughs> taste in politics. And uh, my part was small. Uh -huh. I delivered the uh, newspaper mm -hmm. for the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, it was called The Woodsman. Okay. And uh, my parents helped put that together, uh -huh. and I got to take it out and deliver it to all the people in the neighborhood. So... Um, I had a taste of it uh -huh. at that age, and um, when I was young, I was um, naive and <laughs> somehow thought that uh, one day I might be the president of the United States. Okay. And, um, have since realized that that was um, <laughs> something that I don't want to do. <laughs> it's funny how often people come to that conclusion. I was uh, political science when I went to James Madison, and I got done and was immediately like, yeah, I don't think I want to do this politics thing anymore, so more power to you for actually – finding your way into it. In the in the time you've been on the board, I would imagine there's a lot that you learn, right? Um, you know, you learn about the county, you learn about your district, you know, even even when you're running, even when you're looking to to serve, you know, there's there's a whole lot that you you don't know, right? Um, these first couple of years, how has it been uh, as a supervisor and 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 how have how has it changed in your mind in the short time that you've been there? Well, it's definitely been a a challenging learning curve. Mm -hmm. I thought I knew everything I would need to know, <laughs> and I found out very quickly that uh, I had no idea about a lot of things. <laughs> it didn't take long yeah. to um, start the learning curve, right. and um, quite frankly, two years in, I think I'm just getting um, my feet right. <laughs> stable yeah. right. yeah. um, to understand all of the issues, right. and quite honestly, I think now that it probably takes almost one full term yeah. four years to really get right to understanding the position yeah um there's many things that i've learned about um that i never thought i would be interested in mm -hmm. um one of the uh hot topics out there right now is um turf fields at mm -hmm. schools yes and yes. Um, there's been some feedback from people that absolutely want it yeah and there's been feedback from people that are absolutely against it mm -hmm. and um, taking a lot of time to uh, learn about the topic, mm -hmm. the costs associated with mm -hmm. it, and to really work through that. Mm -hmm. um, that's not something that was ever on my radar right, or that yeah. I thought that I was right. going to right. become an expert on by right. any means. Right. And that's just one of the many issues. Mm -hmm. um, traffic, yeah. trash, um, yeah. <laughs> cutting the grass in the median. Right. Uh, there's so many things that... Um, we take for granted that a lot of that is the county's responsibility. Right. Um, and actually, many of those things are the state responsibility right. through VDOT. And a lot of people don't know the difference, right? A lot of people don't know that, like, oh, you know, in this county or in that county, you know, they handle their own roads. But in this in, in this county, you know, VDOT handles roads or VDOT handles those medians and stuff. For a lot of folks, you know, what government does is this thing that exists just outside of their everyday life. It's not something they understand. So I imagine for somebody in your position, you get a lot of, you know, folks who are asking questions and you're like, well, actually, we can help with that. Um, and I would imagine that happens fairly often, right? It does. Um, quite often people ask us uh, questions about their utility bills, mm -hmm. um, about um, ordinances in the county. Right. Um, 
about many different things, mm-hmm. and um, we are able to help a lot of the time. But mm-hmm. it is there is some frustration in some of their uh, questions and concerns because you would think that being the closest official to them that they've elected, mm-hmm. that I could solve some of their other issues, right. and they are actually solved at the state level. Right. And quite frankly, for instance, VDOT issues, VDOT will tell all of my constituents that they have to start with me. Right. Even though even though they know it's eventually going to go to them. It, and when it goes to them, they're going to say no. Yeah. Right. But I still have to be you the know. one that delivers the message to right. them right. instead of VDOT right. delivering that message. Right. So uh, and that, that could have to do with um, speed bumps. Many people right. have asked me for speed bumps. Uh-huh. Well, VDOT is not going to allow us to put speed bumps in because it tears up plow blades and it also tears up the speed bumps when the plows hit them when the snow is above the uh, speed bump. So they will tell everybody that calls about it that they must start with their local official. Even though they know they're going to say no to the speed bumps. But they know that there's (laughs) no way I can get the speed bump for my citizens. So that's that's been a little bit of a frustration. Yeah, for sure. um, I do have a good working relationship with uh, many of the people on, in the state legislature that mm-hmm. represent the county. Right. And I'm hoping to work with them to come up with something that will allow me to better assist citizens yeah. when they have complaints. Right. Well, one um, of the of things that nature, one of the things you mentioned just a minute ago was traffic. And I, I got to be honest, having, you know, I'm still very new. You're, you're new to the board still, you know, and two years in, I'm three months into, you know, working in Chesterfield and, the idea of the super street was something that I had not had any, like any idea about until I started uh, researching it. And frankly, it's one of the more uh, interesting things that I've come across, um, not just in, in, in my time here, but, you know, my time in media. Um, it's a project that was essentially started, you know, in the early you know 2010s, right? This thing, I think the first, um, um, the first graphic I found was from like 2014, which was well before you were even on the board of supervisors. Um, so the, the, the idea of widening route 10 and bringing so much, um, relief to traffic congestion there, I was, when I did this research, this blew my mind. So at least as of 2018, there were 44,000 vehicles apparently on the road, um, every day. Um, that was supposed to, uh, along this stretch of route 10 was supposed to grow to like 105 by like 2036, 105,000 cars, you know, on a, you know, using that roadway. Um, was really astonishing to me. And, and and as you think about sort of the scale of something like this, in terms of let's just let's just take a step back. Um, the Super Street is obviously in, you know, in the process. Right. I think we're in the in the um, in the sort of in the middle. We're, we're looking at like a 2024 sort of time frame on completion, I think. Um, though I think they're always really careful about, you know, saying specifically because you can't account for weather. You can't account for any sort of, you know, delays. But in terms of the big picture for that part of your district. How important do you feel like Super Street is to that part of Route 10? Well, I've, I not only live in my district, mm-hmm. I also work in my district right. and I travel that portion. Well, actually all of my district mm-hmm. fairly often, mm-hmm. almost daily. And that portion of Route 10 definitely has its challenges, um, especially in the early mornings and the evenings. Yeah, for sure. And, um, it has been somewhat of a painful process, as all construction projects are. We've had <laughs> a few setbacks, a yeah. few floods, yeah. um, things not always going as planned. Right. But when it's complete, with four lanes going in each direction, um, with limited stopping mm-hmm. um, and multiple turn lanes in a way to go past, it'll be a little bit of a mindset change because right. you have to go Past where you, you want to go, be. right? Exactly. In turn, yep. and come back. Yep. So, and you need to go far enough past that you can get across four lanes, right? To get yep. to your right turn. Yep. To, to it's turn a, it's in. an interesting concept though, because so for folks, and I, and I know that um, you know um, Martin and, and Vernon are running, you know, the animations and graphics and such. But for folks who are listening, uh, I've I've always have to be mindful that there is a video and an audio for those who are listening. So the idea behind the Super Street is essentially they're going to take. Uh, Route 10 from four to eight lanes. And instead of having traditional sort of left turn lanes, essentially what you're going to do is you're going to have all traffic flowing right. And then those folks who need to turn, they go into U-turns, which are not at the actual intersection. So because of the place where Bermuda Triangle Road comes in with Rivers Bend Boulevard, 
They can need to realign Meadow, uh, Meadow View, Meadowville, sorry, road from six from two to six, and essentially take all of this traffic, move it in one direction in in essence, and then give folks who need to turn the opportunities, but not in the actual places where congestion happens. And I think it's a fascinating idea. I don't know. I'm sure you've seen the one at um, Zion Crossroads where they flip the sides of the road, right? So if you needed, to, if you were heading that direction, and you needed to go eastbound on 64. It essentially takes you on the left side, drops you off, and then comes back to the right side. And it's fascinating to think like the way engineers, because I, you know, the more research I did on this, the more it seems like what what engineers and road people hate more than anything else are left turns. They hate left turns. Um, I, I don't know how they, they feel about NASCAR, but they really hate left turns, okay? And that's one of the reasons why is because of the, the way that it, it, it sort of, you know, puts the, everything together in the wrong place. And so it seems like from your, your experience, both as, uh, as a business owner, as someone who lives in that district and obviously who represents that district, this, this will provide a lot of, you know, if you think about the traffic congestion and, as you mentioned, mornings and evenings, um, it's only going to get worse if you think about it because growth is natural and people are, you know, I mean, despite the price of gasoline right now, I don't think people are going to stop driving anytime soon. They, they need that uh, mobility. And in in terms of the big picture, is this the, where would you sort of put the the super street and the route and the widening of route 10 and, and everything that goes with that in the context of the district as a whole? Because it feels like in Bermuda, like that's the biggest place that you can make a huge impact in terms of making things run a lot smoother, if that makes any sense. How, where, where would you sort of put that? Well, it definitely has the greatest number of vehicles traveling For through sure. that area mm-hmm. per day. Um, there are some other uh, areas. Some other in hot my, spots. <laughs> there's some other hot spots in my district. Um, but I'm glad to at least know that we're going to solve an issue, which, mm-hmm. as you said, is going to get worse. And it is going to get a little worse before it gets better. But right. when the Super Street opens, I do look for it to... Um, make a significant change there. Right. And we will learn from that. Um, the goods, bads, and yeah. <laughs> everything in between yeah. um, that comes out of that. Mm-hmm. But I do think that it'll be a, a extremely positive for that area, and it will help us as we look at um, how to better tackle these issues in other mm-hmm. parts of the county. Yeah, and future. I think that's a good point. That's actually a really good point because one of the things that happens – with this sort of project is that you not just, you know, cause this, this was the, is going to be, I think still the first super street in Virginia, certainly the first one in Chesterfield, but there are other opportunities for something like this. And maybe it's not necessarily, you know, a cookie cutter, you know, um, apples to apples sort of situation, right? You, you look at, you know, this intersection or that and you think, yep, super street would be great here. Maybe it's another, you know, possible um, um, solution, right? But the idea is, is that you're thinking outside the box. We're not just like, Hey, let's just, you know, throw up another traffic signal. Right, because that's essentially not going to get it done. Now, one of the good things about this project is, is as we talked about, it's it's on its way to completion. It's it's kind of midway through. There have been, I think, there the widening from Route One to Ninety Five has already been completed, which is great. Um, there's lots of stuff that's you know obviously going to come in. Um, you know, widening Bermuda Triangle. Um, get you know when you come from four to eight to eight lanes anyway, right? Uh, I, I know for a lot of folks, the idea that you're going to solve traffic simply by having more lanes is not necessarily true. But certainly in a situation like this where you're changing the pattern and widening it um, makes a lot of sense. Um, in, in the big picture, though, y- your point about, you know, this is something that you learn from as a county. The county learns from and um, not just, you know, addressing this one place, but then what we do, you know, in other places around the county, maybe not in your district, maybe in others. Um, there's a lot that that sort of comes to that. I think one of the things as, as this project moves forward and, and the more I sort of researched what really went into this is that also – the aspect of everything else is connected to this. So one of the things obviously going on in your district is at Henricus Park, um, that public access project coming off of uh, Route 10. Let's let's talk a little bit about that because I think anybody who um, anybody who has a business like um, in, in the vicinity or, or specifically at Adelan Acres, right? If you have a wedding, like let's say you're somebody out there who wants to get married and you're you know you've got that venue, and you might be looking at all this stuff and going, wait a minute, hold on now. What, what's going on? Um, there's a lot going on at that section, and certainly, uh, uh, you know, something you've worked real hard, I think, to, to 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 work with people in that area, so that that there's an access gate, or excuse me, an access road that goes to Adeline Acres that through this project is going to kind of basically be shut off to to non-local traffic. I think is a good way to describe it, right? That that's correct. But I just want to make one point. Yep. Right now, Adeline Acres has weddings booked 
through the end of 2023, mm -hmm. and none of this will affect that. Okay. So um, they've asked me because they've had some people call them worried, I worried guess, yeah. about their wedding that's been right. on the books and right. how this will affect it. And um, this should not affect their wedding in any way, shape, or form. It should, if they're booked there, they should go ahead and get married there. And I just wanted to make sure I put <laughs> no, that out No, that's good. There. <laughs> and trust me, as, as, as anybody who's, who's gone through the, that process understands, like, there's nothing that you don't need any extra stress in that process. So if you have you have that venue booked, you're going to be fine. Um, so they're going to take a, a they're going to put in a new two lane road um, with a multi span bridge. Um, in, the project includes some river access, some boating opportunities, a, a variety of you know cycling, walking, running, uh, hiking paths and such. Um, w in your experience with this this project. Um, why, why, why did they choose? Why did you, why was this route chosen? What was, what was about doing it this way that really worked in your opinion, you think? Well, quite frankly, the whole purpose of the road is to make sure we don't cut off access to Henrikus Park. Mm -hmm. And there's only so many locations that can actually work right. to, to have access to yeah. Henrikus. Um, nothing else really in the Dutch Gap area, right. in the current right. area was going to be feasible. So, Going outside of the box, looking down, coming through mm -hmm. backside of Meadowville, mm -hmm. around the backside of Rivers Bend, mm -hmm. but not touching Rivers Bend right. in any way because right. that was very important to the citizens yeah, yeah, yeah. in Rivers Bend. Um, and then how to work with uh, Adeline Acres, all of that went into consideration. And there was actually two original paths chosen, mm -hmm. and one of them would have put a – what I – uh, joked as a freeway down a fairway. <laughs> and I said, no, we're not putting a road in somebody's backyard when it used to be the fairway for a golf course. That's, we, that's just, that just has to. A freeway and a fairway. I like yeah, that. I, I, I said that there's just no way that we're going to do that right. to the citizens that live over there. So right. um, that I, as soon as I saw it, I, I, the citizens were upset about it, but I just looked at it and said, okay, that's out. <laughs> um, that's a non-starter. <laughs> non-starter. So yeah. then there was a second path that um, was okay. Mm -hmm. um, it was better. It was absolutely better than the freeway on the fairway. Right. Um, but I still was not convinced that that was the best path. Mm -hmm. And um, to uh, Jesse Smith mm -hmm. and um, Brent Epps' credit, they went back and took another look at it, and they came up with a third pathway that wasn't introduced originally. Mm -hmm. And it was a much better path. It uh, leaves Adeline Acres, whether it was to be a wedding venue into the future or not, it mm -hmm. leaves them uh, as autonomous as possible right. from the new bridge location and right. the road coming through. Yeah. Um, and it was a much better Mm -hmm. path mm -hmm. much more preferred so um i was really excited to see them come up with that third option and yeah. um, felt like they had really worked hard to yeah. listen to everything that was shared by all of the parties involved and to um come up with that path yeah and then you know in, in talking with you about this too it, it certainly sounds like you know that 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 existing road which is not is not going to have you know obviously the the, the traffic on it anymore that there will be some access, at least for those who live around there. And that's something that, you know, you've talked a lot with folks down there, right, about, you know, having access to that road. I have. So it's important that we work with the community because at this time, Adeline Acres is accessed through Rivers Bend neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And this project will separate Rivers Bend from all of the, from the road, from Adeline Acres, mm -hmm. from what um, we're looking to put in a boat ramp down right, there right. and possibly even a park mm -hmm. on the water mm -hmm. um, if we can get all of the logistics worked right, out right, for that. Right. Uh, but it's important for the citizens in Rivers Bend to know that uh, it's my intention to work with them. If they want to have an access that's for the neighborhood only, mm -hmm. then we will work to um, achieve that for them. If they decide that they want it completely cut off and that the only way that they can get in and out is um, to go around mm -hmm. and take the new road, then we can work that out as well. So right. I, it's really going to be um, working in conjunction with the HOA mm -hmm. to um, come up with the best way for them to be able to access right. the new property. But I do think that it could be a great amenity for the neighborhood. For sure. And I hope that we can work together to um, – make that an extension of them without them being encumbered by other guests 
that are visiting yeah. that area. Um, it's interesting because this kind of goes back to our, you know, where we were earlier in the conversation. We're talking about, you know, some of the things that obviously the county can do and, um, you know, that maybe even as somebody who's running for the Board of Supervisors doesn't even realize what's all out there. Um, but it seems like in your time, you know, as a supervisor, somebody representing your district, that you found that there are a lot of things that the, you know, that, yeah, there, there are places where the state or the Fed sends somebody to you first or whatever. But there are also a lot of things that you can actually help with. I know, um, you know, recently I, I know there were some folks in, in your district with, uh, you know, some noise ordinance issues and, and didn't even, you know, didn't even realize that the, um, the noise ordinance had been tweaked by, by the supervisors recently or in the, I guess in the fairly recent past. Talk to me a little bit about that, that aspect of, uh, of your job. Obviously, the noise ordinance is something you're, you probably hear about, no pun intended, you hear about, you know, from time to time and, and certainly here recently have. What do, what's been the communication between you and, and, and residents about about that? Well, there was some misunderstanding. I, d- I believe our police had gotten the memo, but I'm not 100 percent sure mm-hmm. that it filtered through all of the channels that right. needed to be part of the communication with our citizens. Right. Because Recently, I had several citizen complaints over the noise ordinance Mm -hmm. and why we didn't have a noise ordinance from 7 a.m. to 11 Mm p.m. We only had a noise ordinance from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m., which was the uh, previous ordinance. Um, Right. They called in, they had a complaint, and they were told, I'm sorry, we can't do anything until 11 o'clock in the evening. I have worked because of those complaints to go back to all the parties involved and make sure that at each level they will get the right answer, which is the noise ordinance now has two components to it, a daytime ordinance, which um, if music or sound can be heard over 300 feet away from where it's being Mm -hmm. emitted from, then during the daytime that can actually be addressed now Mm -hmm. and at nighttime it's within 50 feet of where it's coming from so we i think that we did a great job of putting the ordinance in place to respond to the citizens concerns and their needs um we didn't do as good of a job implementing as i would have liked us to Mm -hmm. but we have rectified that and um i do believe that I won't be hearing about that issue again, <laughs> but if I do, we'll, we'll deal with it. Yeah. Uh, um, it's funny, though, because as a, as a board, you can go out and, and make a change specifically, and then it still, you know, sometimes doesn't get all the way through. But I think that's a good place, too. Like we, we talked about, uh, you know, in our previous conversations about the portal, right, the feedback portal, uh, an opportunity for people to really speak directly, you know, to to county officials, to you know the board of supervisors, to county departments. How important do you think that portal is? And and if folks who are looking for it, you can check it out on our website. Um, how how important do you feel like that is for the folks to be able to provide that direct feedback? Well, not a lot of good things came out of COVID. That's true. But um, this portal really did come out of needing to be able to communicate with our citizens. And although we are not completely out of COVID, we have um, somewhat resumed more in person, mm-hmm. um, but we still have some limitations in the um, public meeting room at mm-hmm. this time. Right. And, um, although everybody can come in and speak, we may or may not, depending on where we are in COVID protocol, be able to allow everybody into the public meeting right, room. Right. Um, but even if we can, uh, if it's a um, something that they'd like to speak on, um, they may not feel comfortable because of yeah, COVID coming true. in to, in person, or they may feel that um, they're not going to be able to get in the room. Right, right. So what we've done now is set up a way that not only can 15 citizens on a board meeting day give us um, their three minutes of whatever they want to speak mm-hmm, to mm-hmm. or um, share on a zoning case or whatever it is that that topic on our agenda is, mm-hmm. Um, we can receive information through the portal. Mm-hmm. Um, and for instance, one of the biggest new uh, things out there is the redistricting. Yeah, sure. And we've received at least the last I uh, went through, I've gone through the first 214 comments <laughs> that came in that way. And I don't believe 214 people would have come into the public meeting room That's a really good point. and stayed for three minutes each to share their three minutes with us as to their concerns. Right. So um, I believe it's really opened up 
another opportunity for our citizens to communicate with us. Yeah. And um, it, again, it's one of the positives from COVID that I think we will, well, I know we will keep that in place as we go forward. Yeah. Well, Jim, I appreciate uh, you coming on the show. I think that that last point about, you know, some good stuff actually coming from COVID is really well taken because, you know, now they can sit at home, they can take their time. They don't have to get up in front of people because as, as, you know, as comfortable as you and I are right now, you know, cameras, lights, all this fun stuff, right? Not everybody's that comfortable, you know, speaking extemporaneously and such, or even reading from something. Um, we'll see how good I am at it here in a minute. Um, but, um, you know, for a lot of folks, this this is a much more natural, more, you know, easier way for them to, to get their information that they need, you know, the county to hear. It's an easier method for them. And so I think that's a, a great thing. And hopefully, like you said, it, it's certainly going to stick around for a long time. But Jim, Appreciate you coming on the show, man. Thank you very much for talking to us about the Super Street and about everything going on down in Bermuda. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. You can uh, follow us on social media. On Twitter, it's Cheshville VA. And on Instagram, it's Cheshville Virginia, all one word. And on Facebook, you can check us out on our podcast page. Just search Cheshville behind the mic. Make sure to like that page so you can keep up with us as we go forward. Now, let me give you all the ways you can check us out. You can watch us on our YouTube channel as well as on our website at cheshfield.gov slash podcast. An audio-only version of the show is also available there, as well as on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Overcast, and a whole host of other services. You can watch the podcast on WCCT Thursday through Sunday at 7 on weekends at noon. That's Comcast Channel 98 and Verizon Channel 28. And lastly, you can check us out, chatsfield.gov slash connect. It's a great place for you to be able to reach out to us and uh, get in touch with us as well. Uh, my thanks to my director, Martin Stiff, my producer, Susan Pollard, and all the folks here at Communications and Media for everything that they do. I very much appreciate it. So, for everybody here in Chesterfield County, thank you very much for making us a part of your day. We'll see you again soon. Take good care.